Welcome to Permaweb Pioneers. We feature individuals, companies, projects, and more building on the Permaweb, a global, decentralized, and community-owned web built on top of Arweave. The hosts of this podcast and their guests are not registered investment advisors. All opinions of the hosts and the guests are their own. Nothing discussed on this podcast can be relied upon for investment decisions, nor is it investment advice. This podcast is solely for entertainment and informational purposes. In this episode, we're speaking with Richard Caetano of Accord, Accord Accord.com, that is. Richard is a technologist and entrepreneur with a focus on blockchain networks and privacy enhancing technologies. At Accord, they aim to empower data ownership and protect privacy by leveraging crypto technologies and delivering a seamless user experience. Accord's social vaults ensure digital valuables and messages for generations to come with end-to-end encryption and permanent storage on Arweave. Richard, welcome. Great to have you here. Thank you for having me. Really excited to be on. So you and team at Accord are building out what may be considered generational data opportunities. And I know that you use a number of phrases like digital time capsule and social vault. Um, I'm interested in beginning the conversation with your thoughts on what a digital time capsule means to you and why do this? That's a great, great question. And we, um, we saw early on, well, we, we kind of had this idea that we wanted to really focus on data ownership. That was the original theme behind Accord. And coming from our last startup, we were involved with a lot of, uh, encryption technologies and a lot of methods that we can apply, uh, towards, uh, towards this idea of creating the the time capsule or what we call the social vault now. And what we saw was an opportunity, um, you know, in in line with the idea of data ownership, there were a few opportunities that we had to address. One was permanence, privacy, and how to get people to work together, right? So those are the kind of the three aspects that we're really uh, targeted on. And when you think about data ownership in terms of, of property, um, you know, when, when we see data in the world today, it's quite ephemeral, right? It's, 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 it's really just digital bits stored on some computer somewhere. And those bits can be copied, but they can also be lost and they can be manipulated and they can be changed and they can be censored. And so there's all of these kind of issues around that. Well, that doesn't really work well with the idea of property, right? So if we want to treat data as something that we can own, then the first thing that we need to solve is how do we make this, you know, real property? How do we make it uh, have some kind of permanent aspect to it. Um, the second thing, of course, is privacy, meaning that um, we can control or at least have some have some um, a, a, the ability to control who can see this data, who can work with it, who can copy it, access it, et cetera. Um, and then the third one is the aspect of people. You know, uh, property inherently um, belongs to people, can be sold to other people, can be shared by people, et cetera. Etc. So the idea is like, how do we address those three actions? So permanence, privacy, um, and people. And when we bring those three aspects together, then we have the concept of the social vault. And we call it a social vault because um, because it's it's a little bit different than how we see file sharing in the cloud today. Um, file f- file sharing really is point to point, meaning that if I open a Dropbox account or an iCloud account or a Google Drive account. I'm really the owner of that account, but I'm also trusting um, uh, the, the the cloud provider who's really administrating that account. Um, they have a certain level of control above me, um, but also it, it being point to point means that um, I'm sharing that data directly with some individual or a group of individuals. And then so if I'm no longer able to access my account or I stop paying for the cloud service or I'm incapacitated or et cetera, then that point to point breaks down. So the idea with the social vault is not only 
do we have permanent private and people oriented data, but also we can, um, uh, if I'm no longer part of the social vault, the group of people who own that vault can continue uh, working with that uh, vault going forward. And so if you wanted to borrow a little bit of the crypto terminology, <clears throat> you can almost think of the social vault as a DAO for data. All right, that kind of positions the social vault uh, very clearly uh, in that category. So that's really what we're focused on. And the whole idea behind Accord was to create a you know, beautiful, responsive, uh, easy to use, simple um, application that um, allows you to create these social vaults. Uh, the other side of that token is to also see the social vault as a protocol. Um, and we, we, we see it a little bit further than just a protocol. We see it as, some, as an important layer on top of the Arweave blockchain. So that other applications can also implement a social vault for, for whatever they're doing. For example, maybe some, a particular DAO, right? You might have some governance and you may have some uh, document files, messaging, and those kinds of aspects involved with that DAO. Well, all of those data points can be secured within the social vault for that reason. So that's kind of a quick, quick summary of what we're, what we're after here. <laughs> Got it. Yeah. So the, it, it's an interesting um, proposition because this is about humans first in many ways. So it's about, you know, being able to share these files with loved ones. And that seems to be an intentional design from the get go that this is actually about exchanging data in perpetuity um, and to make it really easy to access that data and set permissions and so on. And then it sounds like the second layer of this, or there are many layers, of course, is the ability to build on top of Accord. Am I understanding that correctly, that you'd at some point like to, to enable others to, to build on top of Accord? Is that what you were pointing towards um, the end there as you're sharing right. the vision? Right, that's exactly right. So Accord is the application. Um, it delivers the social vault. And then the social vault, we see that as actually a protocol, right? So a protocol implemented on, on the Rweave network. Um, so it's built with uh, the SmartWeave contracts and something that's accessible by other applications, right? So it's, it's not where Accord is not designed to be uh, behind a moat. It's designed to be interoperable with other applications and serve purposes that we have not seen, right? That we have not foreseen. I see. I see. Okay. Got it. That's very helpful. Thank you for, for sharing that. Yeah. <laughs> um, and so I guess on, on this note, you know, the Permweb Pioneers podcast, uh, you know, focused on Arweave and, and, and companies and DAOs and projects and whatever the naming may be um, that are building on top of Arweave. And of course, Accord is building on top of Arweave and integrated with Arweave. So, you know, how is integrating Arweave like a, a fundamental step in the in the overarching vision to to enable, you know, individuals to truly own their data? How do you how do you see that? Because I know you did a lot of work on your with your team prior maybe to discovering Arweave. How does Arweave help kind of solve or change or assist in the the vision of Accord? Yeah, so th this is I just want to say before I jump into this is kind of one of the more exciting things to talk about. <laughs> it's kind of how how we we ended up, um, you know, um, finding about a uh, are we even integrating with it? So, kind of give some um, historical pretext here. So, when when we first built um, Accord, um, we were very familiar with blockchain technology and encryption and those kinds of things. And what we ended up doing in the very very beginning is we started with a crypto wallet. So we built a, our own crypto wallet with some very specific encryption uh, properties, and then. What we did is we designed our own. Uh, we call it we called it a crypto ledger, basically, and it's and because we did not at that time see or we did not find a blockchain that was like um, delivering the properties that we were looking for. We thought to ourselves, okay, let's just go ahead and design a transaction, like basically a a set of contracts that we want to implement for what we're building, and then we're just going to wait, and we're going to wait until we find the right blockchain. And so we built our crypto ledger. We defined, I don't know, I think we probably have somewhere between 25 operations in the crypto ledger. And when I speak about an oper operation, what I'm speaking about is everything that you do in Accord is a, is a transaction. So if I go create an account, it's a transaction. If I update my avatar, that's another transaction. 
If I change my name, that's a transaction, created a vault transaction, invite somebody, it's probably three transactions. All right, so you can see every operation is a set or a sequence of operations. And those are all, um, we store these um, in, in a kind of a centralized uh, database at the time. We store it in a centralized database and we, 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 we simulated what a blockchain would do without all of the mining and things like that. So basically every transaction has to reference a previous transaction. And then of course we're doing all the hashing and all the encryption stuff to make sure that that's immutable and things like that. Or basically meaning um, from our perspective, we cannot change it. We cannot sign on behalf of the user and we cannot see your data. So to kind of put that into one perspective, you know, we're working with a SaaS product within zero knowledge. So we're not leaking things out. And wh while that had some restrictions that implied some restrictions on how we built the system, it also gave the user some really, really powerful properties, right? So the privacy and, and being able to like really rely on this data set. But it didn't deliver censorship resistance and some other things that you normally get from a blockchain. But we were okay with that from the beginning. So that was about a year ago. That was right at the beginning of the pandemic when we started, maybe a little bit more than a year. And we just kept on working and we delivered the entire experience. Uh, that was March of this year. And then soon after, we found Arweave. And we like dug into it and then and then we like fell into the rabbit hole and then we're like, oh my gosh, this is like amazing. <laughs> and then like the whole like the way it was designed, it was like the the smart weave contracting system, like all of that stuff just really matched up to exactly what we were building. You know, it was it was just a really a perfect match. So we got really excited, we really got into it. We we started getting involved with the community and then and then the team reached out to us and they mentioned about the open web foundry. So we went through that program and really got um, exposure to the community's aspects such as profit sharing communities and tokens and those kinds of things and learning how our weave works. And uh, and then we were able we were able to uh, deliver the first of three phases at the end of the the foundry. Um, and I can maybe if I speak a little bit about that, it helped kind of like go into a little bit of detail, but we can talk about this more um, as we go on. So the, there are three aspects that we, we planned out. The first aspect was just getting the data, um, and our crypto ledger. So the transaction set, along with any data associated with that transaction set to get that all onto the, our uh, network. So our master copies are all on our weave and we cache elements of that master copy on AWS so that we can provide a very fast and uh, responsive uh, user experience. So that's finished. That's up and running now. And, and what we do, and what we did, we did some other things to help bring more people online. Like we did a, a top up with your credit card. So we take care of the, you know, the R uh, that you need to store on the, on the network. We take care of that in the background and make it really easy to get on board. Um, the second aspect and this is what we're working on now is actually taking the application and moving that onto the Arweave network. So if your data can be available uh, virtually forever, um, well, you're also going to want to have the application available with it, right? So that you can access that data forever. And, and kind of as we fell into the rabbit hole, we started seeing like, wow, okay, so every, every, like, our application will be available forever for the data and every version of the application will be available forever. And we started going deeper and deeper into the rabbit hole. I'm like, wow, this case is really amazing. And then, and then we're like, okay, well then there's this third aspect as well. And that third aspect is getting our entire business model onto the network, right? So the, the, the tokens, uh, paying in tokens, paying, creating a revenue stream for investors and stakeholders and that, that, that. So that started like taking us further. And then what we saw was, you know, when when you when you bring all three together, and that's kind of where we had this moment. We're like, wow, okay, so we're we're div we're building an application for hundreds of years. Like, if you stop and think about that for a second, um, you know, it it it's kind of beyond what we can imagine. <laughs> Will we still be using like this set of JavaScript and HTML and CMS, CSS a uh, hundred years from now? I don't know. I don't know. Um, but it's, 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 this is, these are the lines that we're thinking within, right. For, for this. So, um, it gets really interesting, um, when we see it from that way, but what we saw was, well, we're actually bridging, um, the web 2.0 paradigm with web 
and that's that's a that, that's a trending topic in itself that we can we can jump in at some point as well. Yeah, it it definitely is, and I do think this is an important segue into the onboarding experience um, with Accord and how you're thinking about it. So there's the you know the the fiat payment on ramp using Stripe, um, which you know opens up the audience uh, for those individuals that may not have R or just you know making it easy to 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 onboard into Accord, and then there's just the the whole onboarding process. Um, which is is pretty dang smooth. Um, I've gone through the experience, and it's about as straightforward as I think it can be to upload a file. Of course, there's modifications and things I imagine that you all are working on and continuously iterating upon. Um, how are you thinking about onboarding? Because a lot of you know this Web two Web three bridge that you speak of um, hasn't really been built out. There's a lot to be built. There's a lot of thinking and philosophy of how the heck do we introduce the concept of a wallet or how do we introduce the concept of like a key or a, you know, a phrase that you have to remember or a number of, uh, you know, numbers and words and all these types of things that may be foreign to many individuals that are in quote unquote web two. Um, what do you, what are you thinking about when you, when you think about onboarding as, as a team and where do you think it's going next? Yeah, I think well, I think the 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 basis for all this thinking it comes down to reducing complexity. Uh, that that seems to be the killer in software is just complexity. Complexity creates more surface area for attacks, you know, more attack vectors for hacking, and uh, complexity turns off a user. Like nobody wants to use a complex complicated product. Complexity creates a burden for the team. It makes it harder to debug and develop and to move rapidly and to iterate. Right. So so really the 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 the, the, the the underlying thinking of where we're at is just always trying to reduce complexity. And so what we did is like starting with starting with the uh, the crypto wallet, that was the first module that we delivered. Um, you know, if you're going from a web 2.0, you're thinking in usernames and passwords. And if you're in a web 3.0 world, you're thinking in public keys and private keys. All right. So what we had to do was, OK, well, we thought about integrating something like MetaMask or Rconnect early on. Well, Rconnect after, I should say, after we just we found out about it. Um, basically, saying a wallet, right? And we thought, well, that could, that, you know, all the functionality wasn't quite there for doing encryption and decryption. And then uh, you're introducing the secondary, you know, thing that you have to install. And and mainstream users, that may be a that may be a gap. That's too um, too, too too vast to jump. So we just built it ourselves. We figure, well, users are used to username and passwords, but yet we need to manage these private keys. And as developers at Accord, we we cannot have access to that uh, to private keys. So that's where we started with, and we try to simplify all that. We we were asking the users to you know write down their their twelve word recovery phrase, um, but then from there we just use a, a standard username and password, and we actually keep uh, an encrypted version of your wallet on our server. So that it's easy to is it's easy to um, to log in from different devices. However, if you were to lose your password, there's no way for us to recover that. So that's where your recovery phrase would come in. So that was the, that was the the simplest approach we could do in the beginning. Um, second is when you know coming back to the Web two Web three paradigm changes. You know Web three involves tokens and tokenomics, which was another hurdle. So we wanted to reduce that, and so having the Stripe credit card um, top-up um, option was a really easy thing to implement to take care of that. We actually have a hot wallet on our side that we manage uh, for the user, so they don't have to manage that and and uh, and you know you know find out which uh, you know is it Binance or some other service to buy AR from. So we took care of that issue. Um, and then also, you know, and then now when you're going from, you know, um, cloud, so, so basically like if you're going from online, right in the cloud to on chain, which is like web 3.0. Okay. Then, then you're going to have some, um, you know, how do you deliver a notification? How do you send out emails? How, you know, how, how do you cache the data? You know, there are certain aspects that work, we've refined really well in the world with uh, Web 2.0 cloud services. 
And a lot of those things are just not available yet in the Web 3.0 paradigm uh, in a purely, purely decentralized way. So again, we're, we're having to still kind of like do a hybrid model where we're bridging the two worlds. And so that was another aspect that we did to, to take it down, to take the complexity down, to bring complexity down. And so with all of that, that's kind of the technology aspects. Uh, and then now we have the social aspects. How are we tapping into, um, how are we tapping into, um, you know, onboarding more people and getting it ex you know more exposure to the to the application things like that and, and so if you're thinking again if you're thinking in web 2.0 you're thinking in SaaS subscriptions you're thinking okay i'm gonna do some digital marketing you know and hopefully get the the product to stand out and i think in the web 3.0 the, par the the parallel is thinking in communities right plugging into the right community uh getting the right engagement you know whether it be twitter or getting involved with like um, the are we um community itself um, and, 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 and going down this more or, organic kind of growth model, right? Um, and what we did when we launched, um, in September, um, we, we gave away 1000 gigabytes to the first thousand users, uh, to help kind of bootstrap the, uh, the, the, the application. Uh, and, and we were surprised. We thought maybe two or three months <laughs> and we, we, we sold out in, I think five days. Like we like we hit that number in five days, which was really impressive for us. We were really excited about that. And so we continued that model. And now we're offering, I think, 100 gigabytes uh, when you sign up, 100 gigabytes when you invite somebody megabytes. into your social vault. Mega, right. megabytes. Uh, excuse me, megabytes. Yeah, <laughs> sorry about that. That's fine. Uh, thank it's you like, for oh, wait a second. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, so we're just continually going down this idea where we're, you know, driving organic growth. That allows us to, you know, respond to issues and to be very hands-on with the community and to ask a lot of questions. And, you know, my co-founders, uh, um, Pascal, he's um, very active on Twitter and interacting with, you know, with people. And, you know, so this is kind of, this is how we're, this is how we're approaching. So simplifying complexity, reducing complexity, uh, and organic growth are, I think, of the two, the two main uh, legs that we're standing on right now. Yeah, well, thanks for pointing to the topic of growth, another topic I'm interested in and in diving into with you. Um, considering the success of the 1000 for 1000 campaign um, and your subsequent release of the referral campaign for 100 megabytes, you know, these these things are difficult to come up with. Really, like on, on the surface, you can be like, oh, well, that makes total sense. It's a difficult process to come up with something that makes complete sense and is very easy to understand. What was the process as you all were thinking about growth um, and these types of, of campaigns? I mean, did it does it like harken back to like, you know, a thousand, ten thousand songs in your pocket type of iPod, you know, analogy? Or where did where did this this growth initiative uh, come from? Oh, that's a that's a really good idea. Um, I might have to do just a little on like real time self reflection right now. To kind of see if I can find the right answer. Um, uh, well, I I mean, um, my co founder and I are very um, design oriented. Like we, you know, we're, um, you know, we desire nice things and we try to like you know uh, work with things that feel good and you know and and have this element of simplicity. So. When we apply our thinking towards, um, you know, like the the growth idea, then I think like that came through when we saw. Well, you know, we I, you know, kind of just step back really quick too. We, we ended up buying some R for the company quite early. Well, not relatively early, I guess. Um, meaning before the the, the recent price uh, uh, peak here, um, and so we had this kind of like stockage of R, and we we're like, well, you know. You know, how are people going to use this app if they don't even have <laughs> the ability to store things? They're like, well, let's just give it away, right? You know, I think the price was like, um, you know, um, we were able to offer a discount. You know, if, if you buy it through us, I think we can offer like a ten percent discount or twenty percent discount, depending on on the numbers, of course. Um, so it, it just was just really clear for us, um, and also we, you know. We saw it from a community perspective as well. Like we, if R we succeeds, Accord succeeds, and if Accord succeeds, then we can bring some success to R we as well, right? So it's a symbiotic relationship. Um, 
it's it's quite you know it, it would be a turnoff if we were parasitic right we really want to see the symbiotic um and so that was another aspect um and uh and i think with uh oh yeah we were also um we were looking at dropbox i think they did some early promotions as well uh, i don't know the i can't remember the exact numbers i think maybe they gave 10 i don't know 100 megabytes for free or something like that in the beginning i can't remember the exact numbers but i know there was uh, a use case there that we 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 riffed off of a bit um yeah i would say that those would be the elements that i think we were looking at when we came up with that model yeah well i think something that you point towards which is really important is and, and i guess in my own words just design thinking across all categories so it's not just the ui ux which is hugely important to be clear it's the thinking protocol if you will it's okay we want to have a growth initiative what does growth mean to us what is a nice flavor to growth, right? Like what is something that we can introduce and have a nice handshake um, to any individual that interacts with it? And it seems as if that type of design thinking, if you will, is being implemented across the board, any initiative, whether it's starting your Discord community, which I know um, has recently you know, come into fruition uh, in the last few weeks, or this growth campaign, or of course the simplicity um, that you just described previously of you know managing essentially the R on behalf of the individuals that are using Accord, um, at least for the time being, and in integrating that Stripe onboarding experience. So it seems as if it's this, this design emphasis that carries through all elements. And this is really fascinating to me as an individual because I too very much so highly appreciate you know, well-designed, well-architected systems that can start with what I'll call a nice handshake um, that is is friendly, is direct, and is basically, you know, enjoyable, right? It's like, hey, nice to meet you, right? And um, so I'm curious, uh, in looking at your roadmap going forward and thinking in these terms of design, creating a DAO is a big deal. And there are a number of components and a lot of, I think, it needs to be said, unknowns uh, about, you know, the most opportune way in which to realize a path of progressive decentralization and then actually go fully decentralized in the format of a DAO or decentralized autonomous organization. Um, so I know you're on the path to becoming a DAO. So individuals that use Accord can eventually become co-owners of the protocol underpinning Accord. And, um, you know, one thing I found really interesting in your Discord is that you're building a community, not a user base. And how does this, I guess, how are you thinking yourself and as a team about this notion of a DAO and following this thread of design? What do you think are important components to designing a DAO that is a pleasant experience. Yeah, we're learning very quickly <laughs> some of these aspects. Um, so um, I think, uh, you know, so, so one of the first things to think about is, you know, blockchains don't die, right? I mean, in, in the worst case, a blockchain may become, may become a zombie, right? So I mean, like it, it may just kind of like, exists but it doesn't really have any activity right but but generally speaking we can foresee that blockchains they just don't die and so the smart contracts the DAOs, and those you know the tokens all those kinds of things that are uh, the contents of the blockchain uh you know they're they, they're they're perpetual they will just always work as long as of course there's miners and things like that to support the blockchain um, unless there's some kind of new approach to to to, to carrying that forward and so what we're thinking about is, okay, so how do we create, how do we apl apply this design slash simplistic thinking model to, to designing a DAO that makes sense for um, investors, users, and developers, right? So how do we, how do we, how do we position those people around the DAO um, in, in, a, in a certain way that makes sense? And so for investors, um, you know, there, there are some legal aspects that we have to deal with, 
the SEC, for example, in the United States. Um, and then also we're here in France. So there's also some kind of issue, you know, there's some legal issues around that. And, you know, so trying to figure out how that's going to work out. Um, and then how do we create a revenue stream for the investors? Um, how, and if, if the investors have an incentive to um, provide a service for the users, because that's where the revenue stream is going to come from, then what is what what is a proper level of involvement for the investors? So do they um, do they vote on propositions to improve the protocol? Do they help like you know? Do they outsource that to some kind of entity that will handle it for them? You know, and so yeah, so so there's a lot of aspects here. So going from um, my previous company, I raised uh, you know we raised funds from traditional VCs and corporate VCs and we had board seats and we had, you know, preferential rights and, you know, you know term sheets and all of this, uh, you know, all of this traditional VC, um, you know, uh, in the traditional VC space. But now in the, in the Web 3.0 DAO world, we have tokens and there's a different kind of governance and things like that. So we're, one is we're thinking about the investors. How do we, how do we create a DAO that benefits them? Second, we have the users. Um, so how do they uh, interact with the protocol? Uh, do they uh, you know pay uh, a micro fee uh, to the protocol that eventually creates a revenue stream for the investors? Uh, do, does the micro fee get burnt? And do the investors get a yield for staking? You know so these are different options that we're looking at. Um, and how how do the users um, how how can the users provide feedback to the protocol in a way where the investors can respond, right? Um, you know, if a court doesn't exist anymore, let's say this is 100 years from now, like, can, can this model still work 100 years from now, right? And that's one of the aspects that we're constantly thinking about. Um, and then, of course, the third one are, you know, is the developer community. So how, how do we promote the protocol in a way where the developers are... Um, able to leverage this in their applications to extend it, um, to integrate with it. Um, how can they participate in bounties for the protocol? How can they be compensated for that? Um, and how can they respond to the customer's needs? And, you know, the investors, uh, maybe they have like a, a direction that they want to take it. Um, so, so really we see those three, um, you know, groups of people coming together around the DAO Right, or, or this um, protocol, and we really see them. Um, you know, when we're designing this DAO, how how do we how do we bring in all of those incentives into alignment? And that's that's I think the key thing behind this uh, this type of work. Um, and as you mentioned, I, I think you mentioned just re just recently, right, you were talking about how um, you know it's SaaS and Web 2.0 is customer driven, but um, you know, on chain web 3.0, this is really community driven and communities, you know, aligning incentives, you know, knowing your, you know, kind of like where, where's my place in this, uh, community and how can I contribute? Um, you know, it's a game changer. And I, I see a lot, a lot of, uh, discussion on Twitter about this. Uh, you know, everyone's kind of like adding a little like perspective of what 3.0 of web, what web 3.0 is, um, you know, and so it's it's a very exciting time to be in the middle of it right now. I have to say, it is indeed. Um, yeah. <laughs> thank you for thank you for sharing. Uh, you know your thoughts on the formation of a DAO, and I know this is uh, a longer term project, if you will, that you all are working on, uh, based upon the the proposed uh, roadmap for twenty twenty two. So there's a lot between now and then as far as the implementation it sounds um, however it seems as if you're very much so involved in the thinking and the architecture and the design of the DAO to make it nice for an investor to make it nice for a developer and to make it nice for a community member um, which is which is great to hear and these are components of course of like this kind of design thinking if you will um, of caring about every single component of contact it's like hey there are a number of pathways here. We want every single pathway, every single doorway to be a pleasant experience. So it's uh, it's great to hear. And there's so many things that are being built out that are not yet discovered as far as this the orientation of a DAO. What is the most opportune format? Um, how does the community engage with the DAO? 
You know, there's all these voting mechanisms and things that I think are still being sorted um, to bring into a cohesive sort of experience where it's obvious, it's easy, and it's enjoyable. I mean, the, the, the third layer, I think, is really important where it's fun. And it's, and it's, um, it's nice to, to, to interact with the DAO. Um, and speaking on the kind of high-level feature list of, of, you know, things to come, with Accord. I'm interested in exploring uh, a bit of these. I know you recently uh, launched the referral program for that 100 megabytes uh, of storage, which is which is great. And I know there's some batch actions and uh, an Accord wallet 2.0. Um, I'm interested in, in speaking uh, more specifically to this notion of the Accord Explorer and PermaWeb galleries. So if if it's okay, um, if you don't mind, I'm curious of, you know, your vision for that and how you see this fitting into the larger kind of platform and protocol that is Accord. Okay, right. Yeah. So as I mentioned uh, earlier, so th there's three phases to this rollout, and this is and the three phases will 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 signify that we've accomplished our goal, which is to completely decentralize Accord. And so the first phase was moving the data onto our weave. The second is the application. And then the third aspect is moving the business model, right? So what we're, when we're talking about the Explorer, the Accord Explorer and Gallery, we're talking about the second phase, which is getting the applications on there. So right now, our, our crypto ledger, our transaction set is entirely on our weave as well as the data. Um, however, we still have to go to Accord.com uh, to be able to to, pre to present that uh, information in a certain way that, that that's easy to use. So we're, our plan is by the end of this year to roll out the Accord Explorer, which is very, you know, it's very similar to um, a blockchain explorer, right? Where you're able to kind of follow transactions and, and see what's happening, what kind of activity is happening on the network. Uh, the same way that would apply towards Accord. So you can go to an Explore, the Accord Explorer and be able to see, for example, like uh, what vaults am I a part of? Um, what are the latest transactions in those vaults? Um, ha has people, ha has anyone posted any new messages or uploaded any data? Um, you know, and hopefully be able to get notified of that and things like that. So the Accord Explorer is kind of like the, the bare bones um, um, uh, tool that you would want to use to just navigate the Accord space, right? The social vault space. And that would also apply for any um, third party or any additional applications out there that is using the same protocol. So that's what the Accord Explorer will allow you to do. Um, ideally, you would be able to open the Explorer with your uh, wallet and be able to browse, view, decrypt, uh, hopefully post, to contribute new information, new data, upload messages, things like that um, through the Explorer. Um, the second part of that is this uh, gallery idea. And this is where I think we, we see ourselves engaging more with the open source community. Um, and the idea is that if you have a social vault and there's messages and documents and digital assets such as um, uh, tokens or NFTs and things like that, if this is all stored within your social vault, the gallery is is kind of like the view of that social vault. So it's the presentation of that vault. So I, I, I could create, like for example, if I'm a musician and I'm using the social vault to um, manage kind of private or even public, but mostly private um, uh, audio files and music, things like that, I might want to have a certain kind of viewer that is oriented towards audio playback. You know, maybe it, I can I can like post a message at a certain uh, a, a certain time within the song, um, for example, um, you know, bringing in the collaborative aspects um, of the social vault. Well, to do that, I might need to just build out this kind of like um, audio oriented uh, gallery for the social vault. But then you can also imagine something for movies or film or you can imagine something, you know, maybe for um uh, maybe, maybe for like uh, uh, legal aspects for lawyers, you might want to have like redline abilities of the documents and things like that. So 
the idea with the gallery is just being able to create a presentation view or layer for your social vault that's oriented for specific use cases. And we see that as being an open source uh, first approach, right? We'll, we'll put out a, the first one or two different galleries, and then we'll allow people to like fork that and like make that into something else as they, as they want. Um, so that, yeah, those are the two things that we, we intend on rolling out by the end of this year. Uh, before getting into the the third phase, which is the the DAO and things like that, next. Wow, yeah. So uh, a lot a lot to come with Accord, <laughs> uh, <Yeah. laughs> to say yeah. the least. Really, yeah. with the Explorer, the galleries, um, and then a number of other things. I think it's important to make note that you know prior to the DAO, um, there are a lot of other layers here that seem to be intended upon to be built on top of the Explorer, the permaweb galleries, and so on, like Facebook on-ramping. Can you speak to that a bit? Right, right, right. So so <laughs> the timing of all this is quite um, surreal. Um, you know, we, we mentioned at the end of the Open Web Foundry that we wanted to build this on-ramp to help um, use your Facebook social graph and all of the photo galleries that you already have on Facebook and be able to bridge that with Accord, right? So... Um, when we launched the cord, we 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 launched with the idea of a digital heritage for your family as the first use case because it's the easiest one to grasp to the largest market. And if you look at what people are mostly doing on Facebook, is they're sharing photos and messages with their families. And I think one of the most destructive. I mean, while that's a that's a huge um, public like that's a to me it's a public good, right? Like. My, I have family on Facebook. I personally don't use Facebook, but I, I, I still stay in contact with friends and family through Facebook. Um, however, you know, as a public good. But however, I think where it went south, where it became somewhat destructive, is when the algorithms implemented behind the timeline and things like that be, were implemented in a way that are uh, contrary or in conflict with the um, the the um, you know the users, the people using it. And that, you know, kind of, ex we've seen it kind of span out in kind of very dystopic ways in, in different way, different areas. Um, so what we saw was, like, well, the Accord aspects of the social vault, like that, that that's all the good stuff of Facebook. <laughs> so why don't, why don't we just get rid of the algorithm and the timeline and just like bring everybody over and say, hey, like what you're already doing on Facebook, you can do on, on Accord. And guess what? It's private and it's permanent. And it's always about people and it's values first. And yeah, sure, you might have to pay for some storage. Um, but, you know, on the flip side, you don't have to deal with this. Um, you don't have to have this. Ex you don't, you're not exposed to a timeline that's uh, not in your best interest. Uh, so that 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 whole thinking, that whole line of thinking is what we summarize in as what we call the Facebook on ramp, just being able to bring people from the Facebook world into the social vault world and uh, and you know being able to offer an alternative to that yeah so obviously a really important onboarding experience for all these individuals um, on Facebook and this public good that you refer to as far as familial familial connections and the exchange of information and updates uh, hugely important I think as a civilization and uh, something that is decentralized um, sounds like a, an opportune kind of use case for these types of public good experiences. Um, so there's there's a number of other things here on on your roadmap. Um, I'm interested in transitioning a little bit into you know the notion of building on top of Accord and what you're looking for as far as developers, right? Like how does, how can someone contribute to Accord now or maybe in the near term future? Oh, that's a good question. Um, well, right now we're, we're still, um, a bit closed source. So we, we will, we'll be flipping that open, uh, by the end of the year. Um, I think the first, uh, entry points that would make most sense for developers would be the, uh, Accord, Accord Explorer and the galleries. Right, those will be completely open source from the beginning, uh, completely Web 3.0, and living perpetually on the Arweave network. Um, and we we will be. 
I'm not sure exactly what time we'll start doing this, but we will be engaging with uh, the developer community through bounties, um, either through um, the DAO that we expect to create soon, um, or just directly with crypto uh, in the meantime as a bridge. Uh, so that would be the, yeah, so coming in with the Explorer and the Gallery would be the, the projects that would be first available for developers, and that would be in an open source basis, and then there would be some bounties to help jumpstart that development track. Okay, great. That's great to know. And uh, at the time of recording, which is, this is, you know, October of 2021, um, I'm just curious, are you looking for any particular roles to fill um, now, whether it's community development or developers or designers? Um, basically, are you hiring at, at this moment in time? Oh, that's, a, that's a good question. Yeah, I mean, I think the way we see hiring at this time is mostly engaging through uh, the community. Um, I'm involved with a lot of like, for example, NFT projects, and it seems like everybody's working on five projects at the same time. <laughs> so everyone's just kind of, um, it's like a, a, like a beehive, you know, everyone's just kind of working in different uh, hexagons. So uh, we kind of want to plug into that. Um, but specifically the two, I think I would say the two profiles that we would be initially interested in would be, um, um, s smart weave developers, uh, or R weave developers, people who are familiar with uh, the R weave uh, ecosystem, uh, to basically help build out the crypto ledger, or, or um, I should say the social vault protocol. That would be the thing most interested. In. And then, like, you know, web developers, HTML, JavaScript, um, React, things like that. Um, and then also, I, I would think soon we would probably look. We start looking for a community manager, uh, someone to help kind of like drive some of the social media aspects or things like that, the community aspects, and help us to, um, you know, invest more in the organic growth model that we're developing. So I would think that those two, those two elements, um, or those two profiles, would we would be most interested in. Um, our core team right now, we have uh, five members in our team right now, just to kind of give you some uh, insight on that. So Pascal and myself, uh, Pascal is, you know, um, his background is uh, design and, uh, and, and product design and things like that. And myself, uh, technology and blockchain, things like that. Um, and then we have uh, Veronica, she's our, she's a full-time, um, um, working full-time with us. And she's, uh, she, her background is cryptography. Uh, she came from IBM and startups and things like that. And then we have two contractors, one in uh, New York City and one in Poland. Um, and they each, one's full stack and one's uh, front end. And kind of the way we see our roles is, um, you know, handing off and disseminating the knowledge and understanding under Accord, right? So as people come in and maybe we work on a bounty basis at, in the beginning, but maybe that can evolve to a more full-time role, um, depending on where we're at with products and uh, funding and things like that. Um, most of our team's job will be just helping the community of developers get involved and getting the knowledge that we have out of, you know, this company and in, into the open source community. That's that's going to be our our focus over the next, let's say, uh, six to twelve months. Got it. Thanks for sharing those details. You know, that's that's important for the listeners to to know and learn about as far as opportunities as the ecosystem grows and as the opportunity to collaborate and work on Accord grows with the future projects and the, the current, frankly, there's a lot happening already. Um, so considering this is you know, a podcast focused on Arweave in particular and, and those that are pioneering the, the PermaWeb, um, I'm curious of your thoughts of, you know, if you can, if you can kind of leave us with like, why Arweave, right? There's, you, you spoke of this rabbit hole and there's all of these components. Can can you distill kind of the the why use why incorporate Arweave um, into Accord? Because uh, there's a lot of projects out there. There's a lot of protocols. There's all these options and and things. And um, of course, my own bias uh, with Arweave that there are a number of components that make Arweave um, particularly useful and interesting. Uh, from your lens, why Arweave? Um. Well, I think, okay, if I were to make one quick phrase, okay, so the the PermaWeb is inherently social, 
That's something that, that my co-founder Pascal came up with. He's like, that was his insight. And I, I totally agree with it. I think the perma web is inherently social and therefore it's a public good. And, you know, I had that, I had that, uh, you know, Bitcoin blow your mind kind of experience 10 years ago, 11 years ago, I had that experience. And when I came across Arweave, I had that same kind of experience where like Arweave blew my mind. Right. And, and I can't say many other projects in between did the same. And, you know, when you're looking at, you know, the, the, the world right now is so complex, so confusing. There's been a collapse of reference points. There's, 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 you know, we're kind of in this post truth, uh, world, uh, we're in the middle of crisis, you know, it, it, it's a very overwhelming time for, for people, for humanity right now. And I think the antidote to that is, you know, simplicity and where can we find foundational trust? Where can we come back and be common and find like, okay, what, okay, what, what makes sense? You know, okay, we, we want to deconstruct everything right now. Okay, you know, every, everything is like kind of being taken apart, blown apart. You know, <laughs> it's just really crazy. And, you know, um, we have a lot of divisive um, things happening, whether it be politics, whether it be vaccine mandates, whether it be, I mean, it's just like the list just goes on and on and on. And we just got to like, hey, hey, everyone, let's kind of like, we got it. All right. Now let's kind of come back <laughs> and let's find the things that are reliable, that are useful, that are helpful, that, you know, bring people together, that help, you know, protect the universal rights of every individual. You know, like, like, you know, let, okay, yeah, what you have to say may be completely wrong in every dimension, but the fact that you're able to say it is just the way that you're able to evolve and develop your thinking and be part, you know, like we all have to give each other that space. And the technologies that help us to do that are the technologies that we need to double down on. And what we have not seen before our weave is we have not seen permanent data storage, right? Everything has been temporal based, whether it be cloud storage providers or whether it be, um, you know, Filecoin and these, um, you know, IPFS, you know, there, there's many different protocols out there that are doing storage, but it's all temporally based. So you, you're paying for time uh, to store data. Um, I think what makes our weave so special is you pay up front and you pay into an endowment, and the endowment takes care of the perpetual storage uh, for your data. And, you know, that unlocks so many different dimensions of technology. And, you know, um, I, I think there was a, an early use case where Apple, is it Apple Daily in Taiwan or something like this? I can't remember the story. You, you may have the details where some of the articles before they were shut down were uploaded to Arweave and saved. Yeah, someone uploaded uh, that that content to the Arweave. Yeah, so like, you know, that that could be quite useful, right? <laughs> you know, we need to have a uh, something that we can rely on. So I think, I think that, um, you know, with foundational technologies like Arweave, then we can start unlocking applications and systems and new ways of um, of uh, bringing people together on top of it. And I think that's one of the um, yeah, I, 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 I'm careful to position it as a promise of, of our weave, but I, I could see it's one of the, you know, benefit of the benefits that come from it. Sure. Well, well, beautifully said, and, and thank you for, for sharing your thoughts on why our weave, um, thank you for, for being here. We're going to wrap up, uh, Richard Caetano of Accord, um, for the listeners, you can visit accord.com that's a k o r d.com and richard where else can listeners find more about accord you could follow the twitter account um accord team at accord team or you can join the discord and yeah accords discord hmm. that's, <laughs> i never really put those two together <laughs> well uh a lot of opportunities to, to, to connect whether on twitter or discord um, or the website itself 
Uh, thank you again, Richard, for being on the Permweb Pioneers. The work that you and team are doing is impressive and highly, highly important, I think, for the future of public goods and the, the future of data. Thank you again for having us. It's been a pleasure speaking with you, and I, and I hope that, uh, I hope that uh, you know, we can connect in different ways in the future. Thanks so much for listening to this episode of Permaweb Pioneers, a podcast focused on growing awareness of Arweave and the Permaweb. If you've enjoyed this episode, be sure to subscribe and leave a review. Otherwise, share this episode with friends and family and whoever else you think may find it useful and interesting. Thank you for being a part of our community of pioneering long-term thinkers securing the present and future of data. Music